Peter Thomas. <laughs> I forgot my name. Peter Thomas <laughs> Fornatal, back with you. I'm going to leave that in, in fact, back with you on this special segment of the In The Money Players podcast, where we're doing a little bit of a departure here. We are going to talk about some harness racing, because we've got huge midweek harness racing happening. And to talk about it with us, we bring him in now from the Harness Players podcast, my man, Ray Catolo. Ray, how are things? I uh, th think things are obviously going better as uh, the recording continues. I'm glad that uh, you made that mistake. I was about to say I'm Peter Thomas. I, I can't even say it. <laughs> I, I think it's just it's a hard name syllables. to say, to be fair. There are too many syllables happening and there's uh, there's just a cacophony between the consonants <laughs> and the vowels. So I, I understand that. That's why my dad just named me Ray, because <laughs> he, he can't mess that one up. Very straightforward. Uh, is it as straightforward as some of these races we're going to be talking about in this segment, starting with the 2024 Harris Hoosier Park Pacing Derby, one of the big races we have coming up this week? And, you know, if I'm just betting by names, it's over already, Ray, because I'm just too amused by the name of the morning line favorite, Little Rocket Man. How serious of a contender? Is this a favorite to be with or a favorite to oppose? He, he's a serious contender, but uh, to what you said, is this a straightforward race? I think it's always – I personally think the best races are not straightforward because that already means that there's a little bit of an edge to actually you know following the horses, being able to break down maybe how the race sets up, if maybe it seems too speed heavy to try and find a closer. And something like this happened in um, Hoosier's other pacing race earlier this year, the Dan Patch. It seemed like a fairly straightforward affair. I know many of us on the Harness Players podcast uh, were with Charlie May and even thought a horse like Little – oh, no, Buzzsaw Russ was the big favorite inside of that race for Melissa Essage. And he didn't show up. It was Duncan uh, who was able to pull off an upset inside of this race. And that horse is back inside of the Hoosier Park Pacing Derby. Interestingly enough, with that feather already in his cap, no action on the morning line whatsoever. He's 12 to 1 inside of a race that also has so many other horses starting to put pieces together. Like, it's my show. The two comes in off a win in the Canadian Pacing Derby. And his big quirk was that he was a big speed type for a long time. And it probably just like torqued his engine too much. So they were able to kind of teach him how to race from off the speed. And ever since that, he's ever since he's found that dimension, he's found a whole new career. He basically went from having to just dive into the shed row and go into daddy duties to being able to find a second life on the racetrack. And so if he's, uh, you know, eight to one on the morning line, I see him as a possible contender inside of this race as well. It has a lot of room to go against little rocket man with not nothing against him he's been a midwest dynamo for pretty much his entire aged career uh, he even was able to come down to oak grove uh, he won a couple races down at oak grove uh, when he uh, was just in between starts from these midwest grand circuit races but i wouldn't just succumb to the morning line favorite because he's the morning line favorite he, he deserves respect but like the dan pat showed it this is a race where you can get a little creative and maybe get rewarded Give us a metaphor or some sort of context, you know, for the flat players out there. One of the reasons we're doing these extra segments, obviously, you guys are going to have this all covered soup to nuts on the Harness Players podcast side. You do such a fantastic job over there with Mikey P and Edison. But for some who are newer to standard bread racing and maybe looking to get involved, like how big of a deal are these, uh, these races we're talking about in this segment? Uh, well, I feel like they're akin to any type of big day at a race. Obviously, it's not going to be like, you know, Pacific Classic Day at, at Del Mar. But, you know, these these are the types of stakes that uh, continue that grind towards something like the Breeders' Cup. Uh, they aren't necessarily like winning your in where if you win this race, you get a slot into those big races. But uh, doing well inside of these stakes events uh, does influence a lot of decisions down the road for connections. Maybe decide I'm going to supplement into the end of your championship, the Breeders' Cup or the Breeders' Crown. You already see just how the parallels are so strong between the flats and the standard breads there. I can't even keep them apart. Uh, the Breeders' Crown really is the big night and big weekend of racing in harness racing. It's coming up in October. And so stakes like this, uh, we watch them because they help to show us who might be the big players in those year end championships. The same way you're watching, you know, across North America, even over in Europe, uh, those stakes races as all of the champions eventually will all come together as one uh, at the end of the year. The stage is being set, but these are huge races in their own right. A lot of money on the line. Speaking of a lot of money, 
let's talk about the morning line favorite in the uh, in the in the uh, the second race. We're going to talk about the Caesars Trotting Classic. Curriculum, a millionaire, several times over. How important of a horse is, is this just to harness racing in general at the present time? And what do you think of Curriculum's chances this week? It's it's interesting how you frame that because over the last few years, the open trotting division has been dominated by these like these uh, uh virtuous figures. You can even look to like trainers, for instance, guys like Ox Fenstead usually would have these imports that just win almost every single race, or there was always just one horse that was much better than everyone else and would just rack up win after win, check after check. But Periculum comes into a vacuum inside of this division, and we kind of have it on the pacing side, too, ever since Bulldog Hanover went uh, to go do his daddy duties. And no one has really stepped up to assert themselves as an overarching authority. It's been a fairly open division. Quite literally, it's called the open trotting division. But Periculum's performances uh, in the Maple Leaf trot have kind of signaled that maybe he could be one to take that throne but it's not necessarily set in stone just yet he was always a quirky horse at two and three years old uh, he always showed ability but just for some reason the pieces never really came together and that could also be his achilles heel inside of a race like this because you watch how he raced in the maple leaf trot he had a lot of things set up in his favor and as a closer he is a stout closer he doesn't really race close to the speed for the most part. He needs to come from like third or fourth over, really rev his engine and start rolling. That could help him over a track like Harris Hoosier Park that has the really long stretch, that has just the two turns. He might have the speed to chase, but that is a red flag for, I think, most horse players where you see a big favorite. He seems to have this one particular style and it's coming from off the speed. As you know, Pete, you win races by being in first place. If you're already having to climb uphill uh, right off the bat, there's a lot that could be going against you. And so that, in part, is also curriculum's proving ground. Can he continue racing in that way and be good enough to keep disposing of his rivals in that way? Or will eventually that style uh, start getting the better of him and open the door for someone else to grab it? Well, that's where I'm going to hold your feet to the fire, my friend, and ask you for your idea of the winner, or if not the winner, at least the one we want to be betting on in this year's Caesars Trotted Classic. I feel like price-wise, just going off how the morning line is right now, uh, Chapper Kraz is interesting. Uh, this is a horse that's probably going to be firing forward, and no matter what, that's going to be a good thing uh, inside of harness racing. Much like the flats, uh, there is a benefit to sitting close to the speed. And Chapper Kraz is a horse that was able to show how swift he is off the gate in the Hamiltonian maturity all the way back in July, launched from the farthest post outside, post 10 in that mile and an eighth race, to get over to the lead. And then he ended up getting shuffled, but burst through to win in the Hamiltonian maturity. So join the fact that he has that early speed with also then that handiness to be able to survive position changes and then be able to uh, change paths and then get restarted and re-engaged uh, to try and assert himself into the mix. With the open stretch at Harris Hoosier Park too, I feel like Chapper Kraz could work a positive trip and uh, maybe uh, be able to sneak through and grab the victory in the event that Periculum gets rolling a bit too late. And he's six to one on the morning line, which makes him, I think, the fifth choice inside of that race. I also got to give a shout out to my boy Jay Hawk Stetler. Uh, he's a native at Harris Hoosier Park. He's stabled there. He always is a threat inside of races like this. And he's got a really nice horse in Ponda Jet, who's 15 to one. Uh, maybe one that you want to consider for the exotics. Uh, inside of that race sounds like some good ideas to mix in and a, a market that has plenty of depth to it i love the way you were just describing that i mean it's just like flat racing where you have horses that are more push button as you were as you were describing and then you have horses who are more grindy they need they need setups they need things to go right they they're seeding a head start to the field i mean it's really very similar dynamics you can see where and for a lot of flat players who don't know this i mean trip handicapping come straight from harness racing. Well, oh, absolutely. And and I'll I'll tell you this too, I had an evolution inside of my handicapping game inside of harness specifically because I spent probably a year, year and a half betting purely British racing, British flats, even British steeplechase racing. And I learned a lot about just like watching how horses move, watch 
just how the trips unfold, watch how uh, jockeys would strategize and even just be able to just pick up on those little things that believe it or not, you can also translate into how you watch harness races. They're, they're, the, <laughs> the paradigm is quite similar uh, for Am I yeah. correct that you get many more trips in harness racing than certainly that in like some straight course in Europe simply because of the, the tight bends and, you know, the, the relative lack of agility of the animals having to carry the, the, the sulky with them? Is that fair to say? Uh, I, I'd say so. And on top two in harness, they always tend to line up in single file. You only kind of see that uh, whenever you would watch like the straight flat racing at like ascot i still don't understand how to handicap trip inside of like a straight mile race i've spent so many nights or so many afternoons watching newcastle for an example and just not understanding how to figure out where these guys are going to set up but you know that that makes the magic of that uh end of the sport magical and on top of that in harness uh, that it, it it gives it its extra spice of just Definitely. How, how, of how it unfolds yeah we, we could go on for an hour about this particular topic we won't we, we won't <laughs> hear but we'll do it at some point on another on another podcast but i think that's a it's a really interesting point i mean but i think one point i will make is i think this is part of why form has so much primacy in english racing as opposed to here where we're more figure and and trip oriented you know, form in the sense of who beat whom i think it tends to stand up a little bit more when you're coming out of you know straight mile races as opposed to races with bends where the dynamics are changing but anyway that's a tangent <laughs> but before i let you go we do have one other huge race to talk about we're going to move our tack and we're going to head out to uh columbus ohio and ask you for a quick thought about the the little brown jug just so cool to have all this extra um action in the middle of the week no you're going to be doing a live stream we'll be giving you a nice lead in from this week's horse players happy hour encourage folks to play in our horse players happy hour game at horseplayers.com and then stick around for the live uh in the money harness coverage of the little brown jug but for the folks listening to this show if you could give us an early idea of which way you're leaning it'd be much appreciated uh, i was also gonna say if you need another excuse to like harness racing it never stops it never stops. The state there's stakes almost every single day. I swear there even sometimes I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm like, wait, this stake was today because they, they, they just keep throwing them out there. And as you said, this is the middle of the week. This is on Thursday. The little brown jug. It's a five hundred thousand dollar race. On top of that, we have a mil we have two million dollar races this weekend at a uh, Mohawk Park for the two year olds. Just endless action. But specifically inside of the jug. Uh, it's an intriguing race because Anthony Beaton has had the leading sophomores in the whole division. Both of them. That That's the key thing. You rarely see trainers that have both of the best horses, uh, unless maybe they're Bob Baffert. Yeah. But uh, Beaton has Nijinsky and Legendary Hanover. Nijinsky won uh, the North America Cup earlier this year up at Woodbine Mohawk Park, and then Legendary Hanover won in the Meadowlands Pace. But uh, between them, I feel like Nijinsky probably is the favorite going in just because he seems a lot more push button than Legendary Hanover. Nijinsky can just fire, take back, fire, take back. Legendary, he has to kind of ease into things. But when he can start rolling, he's probably one of the fastest horses in North America. Aside from that, you know, I'll be interested to see how Captain Albano does inside of that first heat. He's five to one on the morning line. I've always thought he's one of the best horses in the division, but he just hits these occasional hiccups. Uh, Noel Daly, though, is terrific in uh, being able to get a horse oh, super 180 out of a really bad performance. And hopefully, maybe because of the outside draw, Captain Albano offers a bit of a price. And then in that second heat or that second elimination, because it's a heat race, they race twice in one day, if right. you can believe it as a flat player. Uh, the second in the second elimination, total stranger kind of catches my eye a little bit. He's 10 to one on the morning line. I don't think he's the fastest horse inside of the division, but he's one that's going to have speed. He's going to be going forward and he's probably a long shot uh, on the barn switch to Virgil Morgan Jr. that I might want to try and slide into some of the underneath spots. Uh, just because a lot of times the jug can be a fairly formful race, especially in that second heat where the chalk can usually get a good draw, good trip, and then get the win. But uh, we didn't see that happen last year <laughs> in the jugette or the jug when Scott Zeron was able to win both of them. Well, make sure to check out all the coverage on the In The Money Media Network, including the live stream for the Little Brown Jug, which we'll lead into from Horse Players Happy Hour. But so much more info to glean. But really appreciate you giving this high-level overview, Ray, and look forward to having you back on these airwaves soon. 
for, uh, for sure. And don't forget the Harness Players Podcast Roundtable for the Caesars Trotting Classic. I don't know when this is going up, but it'll happen Wednesday night. So it's either still about to go live or you can go also watch that on the In The Money feed. Love it. Check out the probably the replay by the time the video gets up. But for people listening to the audio of this, make sure to go to YouTube and get that done. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe to the In The Money Media YouTube channel so you never miss any of our YouTube-exclusive content.